last uh, Friday, just a couple of days ago, November 23rd, we began a new devotional guide together as a church family, and we began reading through uh, another book of the Bible, the book of Jeremiah. So if you did not get one, they are available at all of the exits, side doors, they're right outside the doors, on the hallway walls mounted there in a wall rack. And as you go out the back doors, they're right as you go out into the parking lot in a wall rack there right by the uh, outer doors. And uh, I wish that you, it's, that this devotional guide is on Jeremiah chapters 1 through 27. And so if you are, uh, haven't started, it would be easy for you to get a devotional guide and get caught up with us uh, today and then read through Jeremiah uh, with us together. So we're in Jeremiah chapter 1 this morning. There's no better place to begin in any book of the Bible than at the beginning, and that's what we usually do. If you want to use one of our study Bibles there, uh, they're in the rack on the back of the pew in front of you, a little black Bible, and you can open that black study Bible to page 479. And at page 479, you will be at Jeremiah uh, chapter 1. We're going to talk this morning about the call of Jeremiah or Jeremiah's calling. So let's go ahead and put Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 1 on the board. Notice how it begins. It begins by saying the words of Jeremiah. So whose words are we actually reading? when we read the Bible? Are we reading words that came from the mind and the intellect of a man by the name of Jeremiah? And on that matter, whose words are we reading when we read any book of the Bible? Are we reading just the words, the thoughts of a human author? I say to you that the Bible is not a book of aspirations. An aspiration is that expression of a desire or a hope or dreams or ambitions. The Bible's not a book of aspirations. Jeremiah didn't sit one day and look at a sunset and said, ah, I'm looking at that sunset and that makes me think about how the sun is setting on the people of Judah. No, that's not what the Bible is at all. It's not a book of aspirations. The Bible is a book of inspiration. And what do you mean by inspiration? Well, I was going to try to quote it to you, but I don't trust myself. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21 to me gives the best Bible definition of what inspiration is. Second Peter 1 21 says, for prophecy, that's what the book of Jeremiah is, by the way, a prophecy. For prophecy never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And some translations, your Bible may say that no prophecy was ever produced or no prophecy ever had its origin by the will of man. But it says that when men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. And let me talk to you about that word that's translated moved in 2 Peter 1.21 or translated carried along or or translated uh, moved along. It comes from the Greek word pharaoh, which means to move by carrying. Not long ago, we were in the book of Mark. And we were studying, when we were studying kingdom power, and we were studying some of the miracles from the New Testament. And in Mark, let me find it. I want to read it to you. I don't want to just guess at it. In Mark chapter 1, verse 32, there's a good example of what this word means to be moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Mark 1, 32, and at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. 
Then you see the word again in Mark chapter 2, verse 3. And I preached on this, and you'll remember the story when I mention it. Remember the man who was paralyzed, and four people brought him on a cot. And when they couldn't get into the house, remember, they let him down through a hole in, in the roof. I don't know how roof gets in every sermon, but they let him down through a hole in the roof, a.k.a. roof. They mean one and the same thing to me. But immediately they let him down. And the Bible says they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And usually this word, when it says that these holy men of God were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit as the prophecies of God were written. It's the same meaning of this word and the same word where they brought to him all the sick and they brought to him a paralyzed man. It's a word that means those who could not or those who would not have come not on their own, but by the power or the initiative of someone else. Someone made a decision for them to move them from one place to another. And that's what that word in 2 Peter 1.21 means when it says that prophecy didn't come by the will of man. Man didn't say, I think I'll utter a prophecy. It didn't come by the will of man, but men were literally brought to a place that they could not bring themselves. They did something that they could not do themselves because the Holy Spirit of God brought them to a place where they delivered the word. So when the words of Jeremiah are mentioned, I just want you to understand that it comes through Jeremiah to God's people. So let's look on at verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Let me just say this to you now. I'm very surprised when I look at this and I see how much trouble the Holy Spirit is going to to make sure that we've got the right Jeremiah in mind. He doesn't just say the words of Jeremiah, but he starts explaining which Jeremiah. First of all, it's Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah. And then he goes on to say, you know, the Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, who was a priest. But let's get even more careful about getting the right Jeremiah than that. He's the Jeremiah, who's the son of Hilkiah, who was a priest who lived in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. And I asked myself the question, why is the Holy Spirit going to so much trouble to make sure that we know we have the right Jeremiah. And I learned something this week as I learn something every time I study the Bible. I didn't know this. You probably did. You're all smarter than me and I know that. But here's what I learned. I learned that there are at least seven different Jeremiah's mentioned in the Bible. I didn't know that. Seven different Jeremiah's. Three of them, remember in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, where it lists the mighty men of David? Three Jeremiah's are listed in that one list of the mighty men of David. Now the Jeremiah that's most often mentioned in the Bible is the human author of this book that we're studying right now. He's mentioned in other places in the Bible. He's mentioned in 2 Chronicles. He's mentioned in Ezra. He's mentioned in Daniel. And he's mentioned in Matthew. But outside of that, if you're reading anywhere else and you find a Jeremiah, it's not the Jeremiah that wrote this book. This Jeremiah is identified clearly as the son of Hilkiah as the man who was a priest and the one that lived in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. You may remember, by the way, when we studied in the book of Joshua and we studied how God gave the allotments of the land to the 12 tribes of Israel, you may remember that we studied that God did not give an allotment to the tribe of Levi because the Levites were the priests. They were the priestly tribe. And so what God did, instead of giving them a land of their own, he gave the Levites cities. 
He gave them cities in every land so that every tribe, every land could have priests in their land and near their city. Well, in Joshua chapter 21 and verse 18, in Joshua 21, there's a list of these cities that were given to the Levites. And in Joshua 21, 18, it mentions Anathoth as being one of those cities. It was one of the cities in the land that was allotted to Benjamin that was given to the priest. And so God's trying to make sure we understand which Jeremiah he's talking about. His dad's name was Hilkiah. He was a priest, and he was part of that priestly tribe that lived in that assigned city of Anathoth. Now, Anathoth, by the way, was about three miles just north of Jerusalem. From the heights of Anathoth, it's said that you could probably see the walls, the high walls that surrounded the city of Jerusalem. So Jeremiah grew up very near Jerusalem, probably made all of the pilgrimages, probably made all of the trips that the other priest made to Jerusalem. Now go to Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 2. And the Bible says it is to this specific Jeremiah, to this Jeremiah, to whom the word of the Lord came. So it's the words of Jeremiah but we're told very clearly that it's more than just the words of Jeremiah. It is the word of the Lord. And it didn't come from Jeremiah, but it came to Jeremiah in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. And notice that it came in the 19th year of his reign. So you remember Josiah, don't you? When we studied through 2 Chronicles chapter 34, remember in 2 Chronicles 34 verse 2, we read about Josiah. He was one of the few kings that when we read about them, it could be said he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. And in 2 Chronicles 34 verse 3, it says that it was in the eighth year of Josiah's reign that he began to seek the God of his father, David. And then we read in 2 Chronicles 34 how he began to take away all of the temples and all of the pagan uh, the altars to false gods and all of the pagan altars, and he began to take them away. Then later in chapter 34, 2 Chronicles, we read where he began after doing all of that. Now, I want you to think about something. He began in the eighth year of his reign to do away with all the pagan altars, all the pagan places of worship. And then it says in the 18th year of his reign, he started repairing the temple. How wicked, how embedded, how buried deep in idolatry was Israel. It took Josiah 10 years to tear down all of the altars built to pagan gods in Judah. Ten years. And when he finished that ten years, the Bible says that he began to repair the temple in the 18th year of his reign. And I have to tell you this quick, but it's during that repair of the temple that Hilkiah, not the father of Jeremiah, but the high priest under Josiah, Hilkiah, remember, found while they were repairing the temple, they found the book of the law of God, the book of Moses. And he took it to Josiah. And it was read to Josiah. And Josiah said, I think I know what's wrong in our land now. We have not obeyed the commandments of God. That's this Josiah. Now, so when the Bible says that it was in, let me make sure I get it right, that it was in the 19th year of Josiah's reign. That means it's 11 years after Josiah started cleaning up the false temples. And it's one year after the book of law was discovered that the word of God starts coming to Jeremiah. And since Jer Josiah reigned 31 years, we get the idea that if Jeremiah started in the 19th year, 
that Jeremiah preached during the last 12 years of the reign of Josiah. But notice what it says in verse 3. We'll put it on the board for you. And it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. Now, it's interesting because if you really look at the list of the kings, Jeremiah preached during the reigns of five different kings of Judah. But as you begin to look, you see Josiah mentioned, you see Jehoiakim mentioned, and you see Zedekiah mentioned. What's interesting is this, is we don't find anywhere in there any mention of a couple of the other kings. We don't find any mention of Jehoahaz or Jehoiakim. And we read in the old books of the Bible, the historical books, that both of these men reigned for only three months each. So not much happened during those three-month reigns, and very little of the book of Jeremiah has anything to do with those two kings. So God didn't miss something, and there's not something missing in the Bible. This is a story of the preaching that Jeremiah did, and he did it mainly during the reign of Josiah and Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, and not during the short little three-month reigns of the other two kings. And so we get the idea that Jeremiah preached, when you look at the reigns of the kings, Jeremiah preached over 40 years during the reigns of five kings, and he was still preaching when Nebuchadnezzar came and carried away the people of Jerusalem captive. Now, let me just say something. That's background right out of the book of Jeremiah about Jeremiah. But let's just make some points now. Let's talk, first of all, about Jeremiah's selection. Let me put Jeremiah 1, 4, and 5 on the board for you. The Bible says then, and that refers back to what we read in verse 2. That refers to the 19th year of Josiah's reign. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah said. And this is what God said to Jeremiah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now let me say something here. The word that's translated formed here in Jeremiah chapter 1 is the same word that's found in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7 where it says the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Now, just as surely as God created Adam, the Bible is saying that God created Jeremiah, and by implication it is saying that God has created us as well, all right? And so God said, I formed you, and even before I formed you, before I even created you in the womb. Now, there's something very interesting here, and, and I just want to make sure that, that we understand this. In Luke chapter 1, verse 41 and in verse 44, the Bible talks about John the Baptist when he was in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth. And you know, when Mary came to see Elizabeth, Mary was pregnant with Jesus. Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist. And Elizabeth said to Mary, he said, when you came in the room, the babe in my womb leapt within me. But then you look in Luke chapter 2, verse 12 and 16, and it talks about the babe Jesus lying in a manger. Now, let me tell you something that I think is very important. God did not use a different word to describe a baby in the womb from a baby in a manger. In other words, God didn't use a different word to describe a baby before it was born from a baby after it was born. And let me just say this to you. There is no place in the Bible, no place, where a baby in the womb and a baby that's born is treated any way different by God in the Word of God. 
Now you say, well, are you getting political? No, I'm not. I'm getting biblical. I'm not getting political. I'm getting biblical. Now, I don't care what man's laws say. If I have to pick between God's laws and man's laws, duh, there ain't going to be a recount here. <laughs> you know? Sorry. But I just, well, that just came, and so it came and it came. God doesn't see a difference. So he talks about when I formed you in the womb. I knew you when you were in the womb. Look what he said. When you were in the womb, I knew you. And in the very first devotional, I talk about that word that's translated new. And I'm going to mention it often in these devotionals. This word where he says, I knew you even when you were, were in the womb. And even before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. It's a word that means the most intimate kind of knowledge. It's the word that's found in Genesis 4.22 when the Bible says, and Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore Cain. And so he says, I knew you. I knew you before you were ever even born. I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you. I set you apart. I had a reason for your being born. I had a purpose for your life. Before you were even born, I sanctified you. I set you apart. Before you were even born, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah I chose you, but not here in the 19th year of Josiah, by the way. I chose you before you were ever born. I chose you. That's Jeremiah's selection. But let's look at Jeremiah's objection. Look at chapter 1, verse 6. How does Jeremiah respond to this? Then said I, ah, Lord God. Literally, because both of those words are in all caps, they both come from Jehovah. Jeremiah said something like this, Oh, Lord, Lord. <laughs> oh, Jehovah, Jehovah. Oh, Lord, God, behold, I cannot be set apart. I cannot be ordained a prophet to the nations. I'm just a little guy, the son of a priest from the city of Anathoth, which is a little village outside Jerusalem. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I'm a very young man. I cannot speak. Now, I always appreciate this about Jeremiah. He did not say, I will not. He did not say, I will not. He said, I cannot. Have you ever wondered how rich we'd be if we had a nickel for every time a Christian said to God, I will not? Do you know how rich we would be? But he didn't say, I will not. I think he was willing, but he knew he had some shortcomings. I'm, I'm just young. I'm, I'm barely starting out. I'm just learning how to be a priest. How in the world can I become a prophet to the nations. You're going to find when you read through Jeremiah, sometimes he's preaching to Judah. Sometimes he's preaching to Israel, which was the northern ten tribes. And sometimes he's preaching to other nations. And when Jeremiah heard that, I'm going to be a prophet, not only to my little city of Anathoth, not only to neighboring Jerusalem, not only to Judah, but to Israel and to all the nations of the world. Jeremiah said, I cannot do that. Let me put something on the board for you. Look at this little chart. God's accustomed to people raising objections. <laughs> when he says, I've got a job for you. Pastors are accustomed to people raising objections. When we say, I have a job for you. With Moses, his objection was credibility. In Exodus 3.11, he said, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? And in chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered God and he said, But suppose, 
Suppose they will not believe me. Suppose they will not listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Moses had some credibility issues. He had once been the son of Pharaoh. Now he's working for his father-in-law Jethro and he's shepherding sheep on the backside of the desert of Midian. Midian. And Moses says, I got some credibility issues. I have a feeling if I go to the Israelites and I tell them that God is speaking to you through me, They're going to say, who in the world are you? Solomon had the same issue as Jeremiah. Solomon had a maturity issue. He said, I I, I don't think that I have enough experience to be king God. I don't think I know enough. I don't think I've lived enough. I just don't think I'm mature enough to be the king. Isaiah, though, I find this very interesting. Isaiah had some integrity issues. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5, Isaiah said, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Let me tell you this about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was what you might call a national prophet. He lived in the palace with the king. Jeremiah wasn't dressed in camel hair. Jeremiah wasn't eating wild locusts and honey. Jeremiah was feasting every day among the people of the king. And Jeremiah probably was saying a lot of things that he thought the king wanted to hear. Not saying some things that he didn't think the king wanted to hear. And when God came to Jeremiah, and remember, he touched his lips. Jeremiah said, ha. I'm unclean. I live in the midst of an unclean people. In other words, Jeremiah was saying something like this. Jeremiah was saying there are lots of wrong things being said. There are lots of right things that are not being said. And I'm afraid that I am right in the middle of it. I'm right in the middle of it all. Now let me say for the sake of of Moses, that we cannot control what other people think. And let me say for the sake of Solomon and Jeremiah, that we cannot control when we are born. But I will say for the sake of Isaiah, that we can have some control on how we choose to live in the world. And if there's anything, listen to me, church, if there's anything going on in your life that makes you ashamed in front of your friends and your associates to bring up the name of Jesus because of other things they've heard you say, other things they've seen you do, then what you need to do is stop saying those things, stop doing those things. When you stand before God, you're going to regret being silent for Him because you we're worried about what they think after all these other things you've said and done. When I first became a Christian, I worried about that. I had been so rebellious as a teenager. I had done so many wrong things, and I won't get into them, but I had done so many wrong things that I was afraid, well, who in the world will listen to me? Why would God ever call me to preach? Because I've been such a, a I've just been such a bad son, and I've just been a bad student. I've just been bad at pretty much everything you could be bad at. Why would anybody listen to me? And let me tell you, God's message to me, this was just between me and God. God's message to me was, I ain't going to change my mind, so you better change your life. And I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad. So we can't let anything stop us because of what we have done in the past what we are right now. So Jeremiah had some objections, but let's look at Jeremiah's direction. And I want to close with this little bit of thought here. God gives Jeremiah some directions. And he says, first of all, Jeremiah, there are to be no excuses. Look what it says in Jeremiah 1, 7 in the first part. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am a youth. Jeremiah, 
No excuses. Look at Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12. It's interesting, God gives Jeremiah a couple of visions, one of a, of a blooming almond tree and one of a boiling pot a little bit later in chapter 1. We may or may not be able to talk about that later. But in Jeremiah 1, 11 and 12, the word of the Lord came to me and said, Jeremiah, what do you see? And Jeremiah said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Now let me tell you something about the almond tree. The almond tree was the first tree of all the trees in the land of Israel to bloom and bear fruit. It was always ahead of the other trees. Always. So when Jeremiah says, well, I'm just, I'm just young. And God said, what do you see, Jeremiah? I see an almond tree. What do you know about an almond tree? Bears fruit early. You, you think Jeremiah's getting the idea? And he says, I see a branch of an almond tree. And then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. And let me just say this to you, church. When God is ready to perform his word, you can just bet that he will make us ready to deliver it. No excuses. Then look on at chapter 1, verse 7, in the last part. Not only no excuses, but no exemptions. You shall go to all whom I send you. Jeremiah was going to preach to, to Israel. Jeremiah was going to preach to Judah. Jeremiah was going to preach to the other nations. He even wound up down in Egypt preaching. And Jeremiah, he said, you are to go to all whom I send you. You don't pick and choose. There are no exemptions. You are to have no excuses. You are to have make no exemptions. You're not to cut anybody out. You are to go to every person that I send you. Now look on the last part of verse 7. Not only no excuses, not only no exemptions, but he says no exceptions. When you go, whatever I command you, you shall speak. Now I'm just waiting for a new translation to hit the market. It's going to be called the WSV. Well, what is the WSV? It's imagined. It's not really coming. Don't get your checkbook out. But I can imagine it'll come out, the WSV. It's the Whitman Sampler version. How many of you remember a Whitman Sampler? You know, you can still get them. I looked online. I looked today. First, I asked Sharon. That's first. My first source is to ask Sharon. And she said she was pretty sure. So I went online. Well, you can be absolutely sure. You can still get the Whitman sampler. And by the way, online, you can get a small Whitman sampler for $1.99. You can get a little bit even bigger one for $4.98. You can get a nice size one for $28.88. You can get an even bigger one than that for $38.99. And then you can get what's called the Whitman jumbo sampler. In parentheses, it says the pastor version <laughs> for $44.69. <laughs> how many preachers, how many Christians in America treat the Bible like a Whitman sampler? I like that one, but I don't like that one. Mm, that one's good. Matter of fact, I think I'll try this one. I don't like that. I think I'll put it back. Did you ever have a box Whitman sampler with a half a piece of candy stuck in it? Did you ever open one and every piece of candy that's left has a big thumb hole in it? Where somebody been poking around on it? We're living in a day when people want to treat the Bible just like that Whitman sampler. They want to pick and choose what part of the Bible they preach, teach, and believe. Sad, isn't it? But it happens every day. People say, well, I just, you know, I like that part, but I don't like that part, so I'll just dot, dot, dot. You say, well, pastor, sometimes you use dot, dot, dot. Yeah, and so did Jesus. When Jesus was quoting in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus was in the synagogue at Nazareth, he quoted 
Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And when he got into chap, in chapter 61, verse 2, he stopped. And he left out part of it. He basically went dot, dot, dot. Because that part had to do with the second coming and not his first coming. And he wasn't ready to preach about that yet. Now, I think that's okay. I think when you're looking at Scripture and you're taking a part of that Scripture that, that, that teaches us a point, I think it's okay to take just that part of that piece of Scripture and put it on the board. But remember a few weeks ago when we put Hebrews 13, 4 on the board? The marriage bed is undefiled. Remember when I put that on the board? The marriage bed is undefiled. And then after that it said, but all fornicators and adulterers, remember that? If you dot, dot, dot that just because you don't want to preach the hard stuff, then you better dot, dot, dot yourself right out of the ministry. So he says to Jeremiah, you can't just pick and choose. I, I, if I tell you something, you're supposed to go and preach it. You're not supposed to go ask your father or ask someone else or ask your congregation or go to your temple council. Yeah, and, and none of that I have to do. And I thank God for that. I love this church. I don't have that kind of stuff going on. But boy, some pastors do. Scared to death to just stand up and preach the word of God for what it is. What I love about Seminole more than anything else is they want you to preach the word of God just like it is. Give it to us, preacher. If we can't take it, we'll fake it till we get it right. No exceptions. Whatever I command you, you shall speak. One last point. No exasperation. Look at verse 8. <laughs> Whatever I command you, you shall speak, and you're not going to let anybody stop you. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. Now, if the Lord's there to deliver him, then it gives us an idea that some things are going to happen in Jeremiah's life from which he was going to need to literally be delivered. And one of those things is people. Look at Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 19 through 21. Jeremiah says, I did not know that the people had devised schemes against me. Jeremiah is just going along, preaching whatever God commanded him. And then he finds out that there are people that had literally devised schemes against him. And they're saying, remember he was like the almond tree? And they're saying, well, let us destroy the tree. He says, God showed him an almond tree. He says, God showed him, that's why I want to use you because you're young. I want you to bear fruit when you're young. They said, well, let's just use some of his own words. Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living. And then let's say this to him. Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, lest you die by our hand. God says, whatever I command you, I want you to preach it, no exceptions, and I want you not to let anything stop you from preaching whatever I command you, even if the people devise schemes against you, even if they literally threaten your life and say, if you prophesy in the name of the Lord, you will die by our hand. He says, don't let people stop you. But then look at Jeremiah 37, verse 16 and 17 talks about the people, then he talks about prison. Now, Jeremiah was actually in prison at least twice. We'll talk about that later in these sermons. But look at Jeremiah 37, 16, and 17, and I just want to tell you now, okay? This is one of my favorite things about Jeremiah, so I might get a little happy. If I get a little happy, that's okay. They took Jeremiah and they put him literally in stocks and in prison. And the Bible says when Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells, it was a prison underground with cells underground. Later, they put him in a dungeon and they dug a hole straight down in the dungeon and they lowered him down in that hole by ropes. But the Bible says when Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells, he remained there many days 
And Zedekiah, the last king over Judah, after he thought Jeremiah had been there long enough, maybe Jeremiah had learned his lesson about all of this hard preaching of judgment that is to come if you don't repent. Zedekiah sent to that dungeon and he had Jeremiah brought out of that dungeon and he brought Jeremiah in before him. And when he brought Jeremiah in before him, the king asked him, (laughs) now is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah. (laughs) And Jeremiah said, I'm adding this to the translation, but this is just me. And Jeremiah said, matter of fact, there is. I mean, that's the last thing Zedekiah expected to hear. Jeremiah has been in a dungeon for many days. And he brings him out. And he stands him before him and he says, Jeremiah, we told you to quit preaching. We put you in prison. You didn't quit preaching. We put you in prison. Now we brought you out after many days. And I just want to know, Jeremiah, have you got something from God today? (laughs) Matter of fact, he says, I do. I do have a word from God. And let's put the last slide on the board for you. After Jeremiah said there is, he looked Zedekiah dead in the eye. And he says, you shall be delivered into the hand of Babylon. In other words, Zedekiah, you can put me in the deepest, darkest dungeon in which you want to put me, but I don't serve you I serve God. You didn't make me stop, and you're not going to make me quit. I started because God called me, and I ain't stopping until God says, whoa. Amen? Matter of fact, Zedekiah, there he is. Now, I believe, and I choose to believe, I want to believe, and I always will believe, that we are living in the midst of a nation that's saying, is there any word from God? And we need, in spite of the consequences, in spite of anything, we need to say, as a matter of fact, there is. Whatever God says is going to happen. As a matter of fact, there is, Zedekiah. Nothing's changed. The message is the same. You will be delivered into the hand of Babylon, and there's not a dungeon deep enough to bury that in. It's the Word of God. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will remember that Jesus was the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before you even created this world, you went ahead and sent your son in your mind, in your heart. You gave your son for us. Before we were ever even created or formed or born, you gave your son for us. And because of that, before we were ever even born, you called us. You set us apart. You wanted us to be used for your will and for your purposes. You wanted us to be your messengers, your ambassadors, your representatives to the world in which we live right now. I pray that nothing that's going on in this world will stop us from doing the will of God that was formed in heaven before we were even born. God, give us the courage. Give us the commitment. Give us the conviction to have an in spite of kind of faith. The kind of faith that says, I don't care what people think. I don't care what people say. I don't even care what people do. I have one in in whose presence I one day will stand. There's only one that's gonna judge me one day and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray God you give us the strength to make our decisions that will make that day a day of rejoicing and not a day of sorrow. God, call us, commission us, use us to be your servants 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.